right? It is prayer Sunday. Uh, I want to walk us through a prayer, fairly well-known prayer, especially if you've been coming to Rooted Fellowship for a while, you'd be familiar with this prayer. It's found in the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Um, but, but in this prayer uh, are some words that, that God is saying, uh, not just to the church in Ephesus back then, but I believe he's saying some words to us. And really, if we take a hold of this and believe it, God's going to do some incredible things in and through us in 2023. And so I simply just want to walk us through this prayer, uh, unpack it, uh, and then uh, at the end, I'll just kind of uh, launch, if you will, where we're going to be in 2023. And so if you have a Bible, you can meet me in Ephesians chapter 3, otherwise I know it'll be up on the screen. Um, now, it's important for us to understand uh, that, that God, God is, is gracious. He's incredibly gracious to us. Right? And so uh, in order for us to be able to receive God's grace the way he intends and for it to change us, we need a change of heart. It all begins with a change of heart. We need something deep inside of us to move Be- because the, the gospel compels us to do so. The gospel demands us to move, to do something in our lives. And that is exactly what Paul is praying for in Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 14 to 21. He, he, he's, he's praying that the church in Ephesus, but he, he's praying that, 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 that they would move, that, that the gospel would take a hold of their hearts. He's praying for hearts to receive God's grace. And that's the same thing we pray for. We pray for hearts to receive God's grace. You see, when God gets a hold of yours and my heart, our hearts, then not only will we appreciate the gift of God's grace, but we'll also be able to live radically different. We'll be able to do everything that he has called us to do. But first, we have to understand God's grace. We have to receive God's grace. We have to appreciate God's grace. And so I want to walk us through this prayer. Let me read it to us, and then we'll get to work. Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 14. He says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the power in your inner being through the Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height, and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now there's there's a lot going on here. A lot that Paul is praying for the church in Ephesus. And because I believe the word of God is for all of God's children, then Paul is praying a lot of things for us. And so we should take a look. See, Paul begins by praying for inner strength through the Spirit. We see that in verses 14 to 16. Just like in the Lord's Prayer, how Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Paul begins by acknowledging the Father. It's very important. He begins by acknowledging God the Father, our Heavenly Father. He says in verse 14, For this reason I kneel before who? The Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. He then goes on to say, I pray that he, this is still the Father, he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit. See, Paul prays for the Ephesians to experience inner strength. Inner strength. Have you ever felt like you're at the end of your rope? And no matter what you try, nothing seems to work. Not like I know it's a new year, right? New beginnings, new season. 
And so you might be thinking, nope, not thinking about that. Everything is great at the moment. But some of you, some of you are already at the end of your rope. You already feel that way. Even though everyone around you is excited, you, you're like, man, I, I, just, I just don't know how I'm going to navigate through this year. I mean, the mere fact that you showed up this morning is a miracle. I want to recognize that because it's real. Life is real. And so what you need is strength, but not outward strength. Paul doesn't point us to outward strength. What we need is inner strength. Paul prays for the church in Ephesus, but he's praying for us as well. He's not saying, hey, times are tough. Just try harder. Just try. No, that's not what he says. He says, no, no, no. Pray to our heavenly father to give you inner strength. God, our father, may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit. We pray for inner strength so that we might be able to grasp the grace of God. See, if we don't get the grace of God, if we miss the grace of God, then we're going to find ourselves trying to do things with our, with our own strength, with our own abilities, and it'll get us nowhere. And so we pray, we pray, we pray for inner strength so that we might understand and fully grasp God's grace. And God wants to give you that inner strength through his spirit. He wants to. He wants to. He wants to give you that inner strength. He wants you to understand that grace because his grace is sufficient. It's all that you need for every situation, for every circumstance. You just need God's grace. And so he's praying that you would get it, that you would have enough strength to grasp the grace of God. If we're going to do anything this year, friends, If we're going to attempt anything this year or this month or today, we need power from the Spirit to give us inner strength. It has to start there. And and here's the, the beautiful thing. All of it is according to the riches of His glory. That that should blow our minds. And and if it doesn't, it's okay. We'll get to a piece of scripture that is. But but that should blow our mind according to the riches of His glory. And God is glorious. So he prays, firstly, for inner strength through the Spirit. Then he prays for Christ to dwell in our hearts through faith. For Christ to dwell in our hearts through faith. We see this in the first part of verse 17. It says, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. See, verse 16 talks about the riches of God's glory. And then verse 17 kicks off by talking about Christ dwelling in our hearts. So the riches of his glory and then Christ dwelling in our hearts. Where else in the Bible does God talk about glory and dwelling? Now the obvious answer would be like, there's a lot of places on it, but let me take you to two. Where where the Bible talks about God's glory and this idea of dwelling. We see it with Moses and the Israelites where they're called to build the tabernacle. And God's glory came down in the form of a cloud and and it fills it in Exodus chapter 40. The glory of God dwelling with his people. We see it uh, again when King Solomon, David's son, built the temple. We're told that God's glory came down in the form of a cloud and filled it. Second Chronicles chapter 7. God's glory dwelling. And so now Paul is praying that God's glory cloud through the Holy Spirit would fill not not a man-made structure, but it would fill us through Christ as Christ dwells in our hearts. So, 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 so think about that. According to the riches of his glory, but it's not out there, it's, it's here. Because he then prays that Christ would dwell in our hearts hearts, that it would fill, that he would fill, that Jesus would fill our hearts. If we're going to do anything in 2023, Christ needs to fill our hearts. And so let me ask the question, what do you fill your heart with? Some of you are big into vision boards. That's cool. We have goals and ambitions. We have all these things that we want to do. But what fills your heart? 
and enables you to do them. What are you filling your heart with? Have you, have you ever filled your car with the wrong fuel? Please don't, don't, don't put your hand up. Um, but if that's you, uh, you for sure know you'll never do that again. Instead of filling it up with unleaded, you fill it up with diesel or the other way around. What, what happens? Well, instead of that fuel giving you the extra power for you to continue doing what it is that you want to do, it ultimately shuts down your car. And here's the thing, it doesn't happen immediately, right? You actually don't notice until... <coughs> and then it dawns on you that I filled my car with the wrong fuel. Friends, if you understand what I'm saying, I wouldn't have to preach as long. What are you filling your hearts with? You see, your car was designed for a particular kind of fuel. We have been designed to be fueled by Christ dwelling in us. And so when we are going to all these other things and being filled with them and then wondering why is nothing happening, God beautifully designed us to run on him. Let me say that again. God beautifully, he has beautifully designed us to run on him. And we run on his spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is continually anchoring our hearts on and in and through. I know it may sound like really poor grammar, but it's great theology. To be anchored in his son Jesus, this is why Paul prays that Christ would dwell in our hearts. He's like, guys, you, you will do nothing without Christ in your heart. And so we pray for the same thing. And so I ask again, what do you fill your heart with? One of the signs of true Christianity, of true faith, is a deep love for Jesus and all that he has accomplished. It is a deep love for Jesus and all that he has accomplished. That's one of the, the signs of true faith. And so do you love the son of the living God, the king of kings, the Lord of lords? Do you love Jesus? Or do you like the idea of a non-confrontational, always in the middle, genie in the bottle, you do you kind of Jesus? And it's important that you know the difference. It's important that you know the difference because, because one of them saves, the other one is just a figment of your imagination. And while you may be like, I am so creative, there is coming a day where you will stand before Jesus and my fear is that you will hear the words, I have no idea who you are. But, 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 but Jesus, I, I did this and I was at that event and I, was, and I sang that song and I, and I listened to this podcast, all good things. But he goes, you did not fill your heart with me. One of them saves, the other doesn't. So what do you fill your heart with? As you look into 2023, what are you going to fill your heart with? He then prays, third thing, that we would be rooted and grounded in love. That we would be rooted and grounded in love. This is the rest of verse 17. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love. Here Paul uses two word pictures to express what he is praying for. And I love this because our name comes from this portion of his prayer. Two word pictures. The first is that of a plant or a tree. It says to, to be rooted, to be rooted, to be rooted is something or to be where you are deeply in something. You dive deeply into something, deeply into the soil, and you draw life from it. Did, did you hear that? It, it, it's, to be, it's to be so deep in the soil that you are drawing life from it. That, that's so important because some of us, were like, no, 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 I've got some soil on me. But it's nowhere enough for you to draw life from it. 
And you'll see Jesus points this out. He points it out in Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower. See, the the seed that the sower scatters is the gospel message. The good news of Jesus, a savior who offers forgiveness and eternal life to anyone who will confess their sins and trust and believe in him. That's what the parable of the sower is all about. In this parable, we're we're told of some of the seeds that the, the sower scatters and they don't take any root for a number of reasons. He unpacks this in Matthew 13 and then at the end, he then explains this parable Verses 18 to 23, here's what he says. So listen to the parable of the sower, Jesus says. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. And the one sown on rocky road, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, but he has no root and is short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, because of Jesus, because you love Jesus, right? The persecution will come. Immediately he falls away. Now the one sown among the thorns, this is one who hears the word, but the worries of this age and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Friends, I believe that that is us. Of, of, of these seeds here, like that's the one that we're most likely to fall in danger of. The worries of this age. We're so concerned about what's going on out there that we forget that we are supposed to be deeply rooted so that we might draw life. Verse 23, but the one sown on good ground This is the one who hears and understands. This is why it's important that if you decide, hey, this root is not going to be the church that I want to go to, that's okay, come talk to us. But my hope is that you find a church that is able to explain God's word to you so that you hear and understand. There's too many churches out there that just have great hashtags and one-liners. You'll be excited but because you're not deeply rooted, before too long, you're gone. This is the one who hears and understands the word, who does produce fruit. And we'll talk about that in the next couple of weeks. Who does produce fruit and yields some 100, some 60, some 30 times what was sown. There's so much there to be said. We'll talk about it. Don't worry. Because... Rooted, God's calling rooted to be a fruit-producing church. Which means that God is calling you, if you're a Christian, if you are deep in the soil, rooted in the soil, drawing life from it, then the expectation, expectation, expectation is that you would produce fruit. A life rooted in the gospel won't fall away when times get tough. And times are going to get tough. I know some of y'all were going, that's not the message only I wanted to hear in 2023 at the beginning. <laughs> I wanted unicorns and sprinkles. and that, that. Guys, life is going to get tough. We live in a broken world. This side of heaven, it's going to happen. But if you are rooted in the gospel, you won't fall away. There are going to be days and weeks and maybe even months when grace feels far away, and the key word there is that it feels far away. It's not far away. Why? Because Christ dwells in my heart. What could be closer than what is in your heart? But there are times where it feels, it feels, it feels far away. But if you are deeply rooted, deeply rooted in Christ's love, deeply rooted in his word, that you're able to read his word and recite his word. I mean, when you do that, when you read God's word, I don't know if you guys think about it this way, when you read God's word and when you recite, and it's important that I say that, because when you recite God's word, that means that you have memorized it. 
that you've sat with it long enough, that, that you've memorized it, that you know, that you don't have to look. You can just quickly say when something happens in life, you can call on God's promises. When that happens, it is like God is sitting right next to you and he is speaking to you. See, for many of us, when we go, where, where is God? God, where are you? Where, where, where? It's like, when was the last time you read his word? I know you've read the hashtags. I know you've read the Instagrams, the Twitters. I, you've read all, but when was the last time you were in his word? It feels far away. Only because you have walked far away. If you are deeply rooted, you will not walk away when storms and trials come. This is a deep prayer for us as Rooted Fellowship. It's this idea of of knowing who I am and whose I am. That my identity is in Christ. The second word picture is found in the word established. Here in the Christian Standard Bible translation, it says firmly established. Another way to communicate uh, the use of this word is, is, is foundation. Not only are we deeply rooted, but our foundation. A house with a good foundation won't, won't fall when tough times come. See, I also like the word grounded. You find this in the English Uh, standard version. If you, if you, not your parents or grandparents, not your pastor or your family group leader, not your spouse or your best friend, you, when you are established in the Father's love, you won't walk away when the church family hurts you, when somebody says something to you that they shouldn't have, because these things are going to happen. But you won't walk away. You won't go, you know what? I'm done. I'm finished. I'm no more. No more. Because somebody said something to you. But what is God saying to you? What is your foundation? If you are firmly established in the love of Jesus, you will be able to receive God's grace for all situations and have the ability to extend grace to those around you who need it. I like to think of it as grace, grace. We put on two shoes every morning. And so when we walk, it's grace, grace. Grace, grace. Even in difficult times where I got, I got, I got to get up, it's, it's difficult, but it's grace, grace. Grace for me and grace for you. But only if my foundation is found in Christ's love. Am I able to do that? There are tons of people who are able to receive grace but can't give it. That is an incomplete gospel. Incomplete gospel. And rooted in 2023 will not have a incomplete gospel. Grace, grace. What is your foundation? And then the last part of Paul's prayer is found in verses 18 and 19 where he prays for our hearts to grasp the magnitude of Christ's love for us. That's where many of us, we we tend to leave that last bit out. It's like, no, 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 I get the magnitude of Christ's love. Okay? And then we sit and we wait for the rest. For us. For you. For me. And and so he prays that. I, I pray that you being rooted and firmly established in love, then hear this, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and the width, height and depth of God's love and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Notice this love is meant to be grasped with all the saints. You were never designed to live in isolation. You have completely missed the gospel if you think, you know what, it's just about me and and Jesus and I'm all good. You've missed it with all the saints, the body of Christ, the community of faith, the church. Paul's prayer is that we all will comprehend. To comprehend is to know, is to realize, is to appreciate, is to be aware of his love. And here's why. Here's why Christ's love is so important for us. See, this love is long. The length of God's love, Paul prays, 
This demonstrates God's lasting love for us. There is nothing you can do. Nothing. There's nothing that you can do that will separate you from the love of Christ if you have surrendered your life to Jesus. Nothing. We see this in Romans chapter 8. You cannot outrun the grace of God. If you are a child of God, you're going, but the, the things that I have done, okay, confess, repent, turn away from those things that you've been doing and then turn to Christ. He's not going to leave you because his love is long, the, the, the length of God's love. God, so many of us, we, we, we have this kind of relationship with God. It's like he's holding on to the receipt, waiting for you to break so that he can return you. And we do that because we do that. Do you know how many receipts I have in my email? Take a picture. I, I buy the thing and I quickly take a picture because I know, hey, things, things might not work. Email it to myself. So that on that day when it's, when it's not working, I bring it. Aha, broken. I want my money back. And so we think that that's how God deals with us. That's what, like we're so immobilized. We do nothing. Some of us are so feel, like filled with fear because just, I just don't want to make a mistake. I just, I don't want to disappoint. I don't want to, so I'm not going to do anything because you know what? If I do, he may send me back. That's not how the blood of Jesus works. It's a lasting love. This love is wide. The width of God's love. This demonstrates he's accepting love. Christ's love is for Jew and Gentile. White, black, colored Indian, rich and poor, formally educated and informally educated, those struggling with obvious sins and those struggling with hidden sins. Because we know, we know the, one, the ones that are obvious, we just know. They walk in, ah, that one needs Jesus. <laughs> We're so thankful he's here, eh? Whew. There's so much hidden sin in here. On a how dare you say that? Because I know there's so much hidden sin in here. But because God's love is, is wide, it's accepting, it's accepting. The people, guys, we're going to be praying this year. The people in your mind right now that you think are beyond God's grace. You, like, you know there's people that you think, hey, this one's close, so close. I just need to, I just need to, and then it'll happen. And then there's people like, you don't even bother talking to them. Like you've even stopped praying for them. Because in your mind, you're like, there's no ways that God would ever accept them. You've forgotten the width of God's love. Remember, it's his loving kindness that leads us to repentance. He is incredibly kind. This love is, is high. The height of God's love. This demonstrates his exalting love. His glorifying love that the story doesn't end with us here. Let me read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 67 to you. For he raised us from the dead, along with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Think about that for a moment. I know, I know, I know that right now you feel like, but I'm sitting here on this chair that's super uncomfortable. When is he going to end? I get that. But, but your positional standing is with Jesus. And where's Jesus? He is seated at the right hand of the Father, exalted and full of glory. That's the love that we receive. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. It's an exalting love. And then lastly, this love is deep. It's deep. The depth of God's love. This demonstrates his sacrificial love. This is my favorite. I want you to think of the cross that Jesus died on. I want you to think of it as, as a water well where you would go to fetch water. See, the longer we look into it, the deeper it goes. This is why we always point you to the cross because God's love just keeps going and going and going and going and going and going and going. It's at the cross that Jesus himself took on the full weight of God's wrath. He took on the full punishment so that you and I who are selfish and unloving and full of hatred and bitter and angry and full of greed could be forgiven and saved. The longer you look at the cross, the more you realize what Jesus has done for you. Not only do you see the, the, the beauty of his love, but you recognize, wow, me! 
me. It's the depth of God's love. So this love tells us that God's love is long enough to last through all eternity. That God's love is wide enough to include every person. That God's love is deep enough to reach the worst sinner. That God's love is high enough to take us to heaven. It is capable of every single one. And and I wonder how, how radically different our lives would look if we believed it. Let me take it a step further. How radically different our missional lives would look if we believed that. Oh, may we grasp how long and wide and high and deep Christ's love is for us. In verse 19, Paul says, this love surpasses knowledge. You see, what he's saying is that it's got to move beyond sitting here It's got to get into our hearts. That we truly have to believe that God loves us. That it would surpass knowledge. And to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Guys, I'm going to be super honest with you. I'm going to be dead honest. Dead, dead honest. When I first read that, the first, first, first time, many years ago, when I first read that, I went, is that a typo? Let me read it to you slowly. So that you, that's you and I, may be filled with all the fullness of God. Like, like how do you even pray that? The the fullness. Colossians, we can go all the way to Colossians where Paul writes, he says, no, 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 it pleased God that the fullness of who he is would dwell in Christ. That I get, it's Christ. But 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 then for, for some strange reason Paul feels that he can pray no 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 also that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Adam Clark, a British Methodist theologian, says this about that piece of scripture. I was going to do it in a British accent, but some of you are like you already have one. I won't do it. He says, among all the great sayings in this prayer, this is the greatest. To be filled with God is a great thing. To be filled with the fullness of God is still greater. But to be filled with all the fullness of God utterly bewilders the sense and confounds the understanding. This is a man who has just sat and looked at this passage and gone, but how? How? And yet, Paul, as bewildered as he was, still felt confident enough to pray it for the church in Ephesus and to pray it for us. And so we should be praying it for one another. He was, Paul was so blown away by this. I mean, he's praying for the, 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 the church in Ephesus and he's, he's, he's so blown away. Like he's, he's in that place of like, what on earth is going on? And, and some of you might go, oh, how do you know? How, how do you know? Well, it's because he closes his prayer in a doxology. A doxology. Now, a doxology is an expression of praise to God. That's what it means. It's an expression of praise to God. And we see that doxology is scattered all through the Bible. Like, like you see the writings, you see like, like a, someone's talking about God and talking about the scriptures and, and what the gospel has done and then, and then there's just this expression of praise. That's a doxology. And all theology, hear me on this, all theology must lead to doxology. All theology must lead to doxology. Otherwise, if it doesn't, then what we are left with is religious idolatry. That's where it's like, oh, I know all this theology but it leads to zero praise. You're just like, "Mm, but I know this. It it puffs you up. And friends, we we can fall into danger with that, especially our tribe. It's all about knowing the scriptures and what this means and exegete this part and hermeneutics. and like. But if it leads to zero praise, if it leads to no doxology, then it's religious idolatry. And here we see Paul prays in a prayer, in a prayer. Guys, I want you to think about this for a moment. I don't think Paul was writing this stuff going, you know, one day, 
there's going to be churches scattered all through the world. And they're going to open up this every Sunday, and they're going to look at my, essentially a diary. Let's be honest. I mean, some of the stuff he shares in his letters, it's like he was writing his, his dear diary. I don't think he thought that. I don't think he was like, so I need to make sure that I use the correct language, punctuation. Like if you read this in its original language, it's like the punctuation is horrible. He makes up words. Like he's just going, I'm I'm writing about my relationship with God the Father and what I see him doing all around me. Doxology. Paul is so blown away, he praises God. And and this is still part of his prayer. This doxology is still part of his prayer. He says this, Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, again, I think sometimes we read this too quickly because it's like, oh, no, no, we just need to get through this. This is that part where it's like, you know, the email signature. It's like no one really looks at the email signature anymore. It's like, oh, next part. Where's chapter four? Where's chapter? No, 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 no. Slow it, slow it down. Now to him, this is God, who is able, that's a key word, able, to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power, another key word, that works in us, also important for us to be aware of. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Here's the point. Here's the point. I want to get you guys home. Here's the point. Paul prays, and then at the end, in his doxology, he recognizes that the one he is praying to is able and powerful. That means that every single request that he has laid before the Father, he goes, I confidently do that because I know he is able and powerful. So it's not like when I ask some of you to do something. I could put it in the best email. I could add so many adjectives to it just to hope that like, it'll excite you. But I still walk away going, I wonder if they're going to do it. I really hope they do it. Man, I really hope they do it. And then I show up and then it's like, they didn't do it. Paul is going, no, what I lay before God, he is able and powerful. He is able and powerful. And what does the scripture say about about this God who is able and powerful? Well, let me walk you through some of those things. He's able to speak all of life into existence. I mean, that like we should just close the book and then sit down. Because last I checked, I don't know if any of you can speak life into existence. Genesis 1. He's able to rescue from a fiery furnace, Daniel 3. He is able to deliver from uh, the lion's mouth, Daniel 6. He is able to give uh, sight to the blind, Matthew 9. He is able to bring the dead back to life, John 11. I know there's doctors in the room. I know, I know, I know, but not like this. He is able to use imperfect people to literally, literally change the world. The whole book of Acts. He is able to make grace overflow, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He is able to save completely, completely. Hebrews 7, he is able to keep you from stumbling, Jude 24. He is able to do above and beyond, Paul prays. I've just read you all that stuff. And then Paul still has the audacity to say, above and beyond. This tells us that we should not limit God. We should not limit God because he is able and he is powerful. We should, we should not dare to limit God and so many of us do. I know, I know that's not our intention but, but we do. God by grace. Here's the other crazy thing. God by grace uses us. That's how he's going to do it. He's going to use us to display his ability and power. I mean, I still don't fully quite understand that, to be honest. I just, I just don't. But that's how he operates. The same God who can speak life into existence goes, you know what, I'm going to use imperfect people called the church to display to the world that I am able and powerful. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Okay. I'm going to wrap this up. I'm actually going to call the band to come up just to make sure that I actually do wrap it up because we could sit here forever. 
Now that I've, I've done the groundwork, I had to. I had to, I had to walk us through uh, verses uh, 14 to, to 19 to, to lay the foundation so that you understand. You go, okay, okay, here's the prayer. And, and, and this prayer is about God and what he's doing in and through us, through his son Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I had to lay this down so that I could unpack to you what I believe God is calling us to in 2023. Because if I just started with, hey, here's what God's calling us to, it would have gone, oh no, you're asking us for too much. Literally. And you're going to see it in the next couple of weeks. You're going to, if I had started that way, you would have gone, too much. There's no ways. And so I had, to, I had to lay that foundation. I had to unpack the context so that we might be able to see what it is that I believe God is calling us to. And it's also in the text. I'm not making it up on my own. It's in the text. I'm going to read it to you again. The doxology. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think. There it is. There it is. But let me read it to you in some other translations. The New Living Translation says this. Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more. Infinitely more then we might ask or think. Let me read it to you in the English Standard Version. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly. Far more abundantly than all that we could ask or think. The NIV, right? I hope some of you guys are seeing it. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more. Immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And if you want to go old school, you can. The New King James Version says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all. It's, it's almost like they knew, they knew that like they wouldn't get it with infinitely more. They wouldn't get it with more abundantly more. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all. Friends, I hope you see it. And if not, let me make it plain. I believe God is calling us to more. He's calling us to more. More, more. And and it's more of his presence. More of his power. And more of his promises. More than we could ask or think. The word think is to imagine. Let's take it a little bit further. To dream. What Paul is assuming is that some of you are asking too little. You are dreaming too little. You are caught up with the things of the world that you've forgotten that we serve a God who is seated on his throne, who is able to do infinitely more, exceedingly more, abundantly more. And so my hope is that you would you would have that sense of I want more, more of his presence in everything that I do, more of his power, that everything I lay my hands to, I would experience more of his power and then more of his promises that are all yes and amen in Christ.